The first thing is you need to figure out when it's time to switch your technologies. When's a good time to do it? Um, and the best way to do that is to enumerate and figure out the scope of the change you're trying to do. What is the actual problem that you're trying to solve? Most people I see, especially as small companies, when they're trying to be agile, they're trying to be fast, they're trying to do things quickly, they find a new technology, whatever the new hot thing is, and they're like, yeah, let's start using that because it'll be great and it'll help us figure out you know, all these problems. But they don't actually write down what all of these problems are. They don't actually figure out what they're trying to solve. They just want to use a new technology. And that's cool, but if you don't, if you don't try to actually figure out the scope of the change you're trying to do, you can actually make things a lot worse. So the first step is always sit down and figure out what it is that you're trying to solve. The second is that the changes that you're trying to make are almost always going to be a lot bigger than you anticipate. Almost always. They're switching out a database is a, a pretty extreme example, but even adding things like an asynchronous queue, if you have an existing one, you find a new one. If, it's, if your existing technology has been around for a while, it can be a pretty big change. And we as people are really terrible at estimating time. Like we think something's going to take mm, six months, probably going to take a year or two in the long run. I find that most organizations, when they're trying to estimate when to start making a change, they leave things too late. Like if you're bad at estimating time and you think something's going to take six months, you say, OK, let's say it's going to take a year. So you start planning a year out. By the time you get to that year, it may, you may have already missed a lot of opportunities that the new technology could have brought in. So starting like way, way early is, is very much recommended. There's a cost with maintaining existing technology, and it goes up over time. New technology brings in new advances, new ways of thinking, new ways of doing work. And at some point, the two cross. And your job is to try and figure out where that's going to be and plan for it. So think about that next time you're, um, you're looking at existing technologies and when to replace them. Um, can I just get a show of hands? How many people here are still running graphite in their infrastructure? Like two hands went up. OK, three hands, four, five. OK, how many people are using graphite in their infrastructure? <laughs> there we go. All right, OK. That's what I thought. OK. There are other tools out there now that provide a lot of advancements in the way metrics collection, reporting, and alerting is done. Prometheus is one example. You don't have to use that. But there's a lot of stuff that's happened in the last almost 10 years since Graphite started picking up and coming into common use. Um, but switching over is going to take time. So your cost of running Graphite, and I'm not picking on Graphite. It's a wonderful tool. I used it for many years. But the cost of running it's going to go up over time because you're going to miss opportunities, if nothing else. Maintaining it's pretty straightforward. It just runs. But the costs go up. So finding where that point is, and it may, have, it may be in your past, so being aware of that is good too. But finding where that is is important. So the first thing, as I mentioned, is you have to define the problems that you're trying to solve. Find out how much of your current tech um, you're spending on engineer time, just fixing stuff that's broken. How much of it is, because it doesn't scale well, maybe you're having to buy bigger and faster hardware that you didn't plan to a few years ago. Um, and what are you missing out on by holding on to legacy technologies? You need to be able to concretely say what it is you're solving and what it is to have success at the end of this. And we'll get into defining success a little later. But for example, you might say that after we do the migration and we solve this problem, um, capacity will increase by 50%. Or maybe the 90th percentile of your database latency will go down to five milliseconds. But you need some kind of concrete goal that you need to try and hit at the end, and that needs, to be, that needs to be explained clearly in your problems, problem statement. I'm going to take a little bit of a sidetrack for a moment and say this is 2017. We should know what our technology is doing, especially if we're introducing new technology into a stack. We should be able to have pretty detailed statistics about how the internals of it are working. What it's doing, it should send out very detailed logs. And, t and you should be able to look at these things and say, ah, I understand what the internals of this piece of, of, of software are doing, and I can figure out where it's slow, where it's fast, where it fits in and meets my needs. 
if you come up with, if you find new technology that doesn't do this, it's not ready. It is not mature enough for you to use in production. There are examples like MySQL doesn't have a lot of metrics that it emits natively into systems like Graphite and, and Prometheus and so on, but you can get hooks for it like Vivid Cortex. Um, not paid by Vivid Cortex, I just like their tool. Um, but you can use things like that to augment, your, uh, augment the, uh, the introspection, the, the metrics collection of your systems, and you should do that. But if you're not able to do that with a piece of technology, it's not ready. Don't use it because a few years down the line, all your competitors are going to be using technology that lets them have deep visibility into how it's working, and you're not going to have that, and that's going to be a problem. All right, so back to our story. Let's go through a little evaluation. And this is a fairly typical thing that I go through whenever I'm looking at um, switching out a piece of technology, something, something old for something new. So we have our old database server. It has some strengths and it has some weaknesses. Some of, them, some of the strengths are you understand it very well. It's been around in your organization for many years. You've built up a lot of knowledge around it. It's, you know that it does scale. You know that it does what you want, and it'll get you four years out from now, for example. Um, you've also built a great relationship with the community. And that's an important thing. A lot of people overlook this. But having a good relationship, especially if it's an open source piece of software, can be the difference between understanding what you're doing and being able to scale and just being completely lost and probably having to pay somebody a whole lot of money to help figure it out for you. But this piece of software has some weaknesses, which is why we're looking at switching it out. It's hard to maintain, even though we do understand it very well. Maybe it's brittle. Maybe you just blow on it and it just falls over every time uh, you need to do something. This causes your employees stress. Stress can lead to burnout. Nobody wants employees to be burning out. And it's also a very large system and difficult to reason about. Remember that thing I mentioned earlier about being able to introspect your systems? Maybe the software you're using doesn't have. So you look at another piece of software. You say, OK, this new one is a lot simpler. It's a lot easier to understand. I can rationalize it. Um, it's very resilient compared to the old one. It doesn't just fall over all the time. It also has strong community support. Um, and maybe it follows some principles or philosophy about your software that you really like. But it also has weaknesses. And it's good to make sure you understand those as well. Your team may not know the new software. Maybe nobody has experience with it. If nobody has experience with it and they don't have time to ramp up on it, it's not the right software for you. That's, like, that's a pretty critical mistake that a lot of people make. They introduce a piece of software and they're like, ah, we'll figure it out as we go along because it'll, it's still better than the old stuff. You really need that time to ramp up at the beginning and really get familiar with the failure cases, the way it, the way it explodes at the last minute, how you resolve those situations, how long it takes to figure those things out. All of those are important. So your first decision, does the new technology actually solve the problem? Let's say, hypothetically, it does. You decide to switch. There's a, couple of, uh, there's a couple of phases that you need to go through to actually get to the point where you can do the deployment. The first one is the design phase. Figure out what currently works well with the software that you have. You want to keep all of those bits. You don't want to get rid of everything wholesale if you can keep some of those existing things. Some of that might be the tooling you have. Some of that might be the metrics collection that you have. But you want to be able to keep all those, all those good bits so that you don't create more work for yourself. You need to think about your users. What do they actually want? How do they define success? You need to build for resilience. And again, I keep harping on about this introspection and metrics collection and logging and so on, but it's really important. And you need, to th you need to think about that in your design phase. I mentioned that you need to think about success. The first question is, how do your users define success? If you're a web shop, they might demand no downtime, and they might want faster page loads. Fairly straightforward. But whatever you're doing with this new technology has to cater to them first, not just you. Once you figure that out, then you need to define what success means for your business. Do you spend less money? Can you increase headcount because it's a, you're introducing a technology that's very well understood in the industry? Is it going to increase capacity somehow? What's it going to do? And then again, how do you measure these as metrics? The next thing is gaining consensus. Um, how many of you work in companies larger than, let's say, 400 people, 300 people, right? 
quite a lot of us, almost most of us, there's a good probability that if you're working with, in such a company, you're gonna have to gain consensus, not just in your team, but across teams. You're gonna have to engage other people and figure out how to, how to get this new piece of technology in and convince people it's the right thing to do. This can be really hard because it's not a technology problem, it's a people problem. If the existing technology is well entrenched and very well understood by people, not everyone may not understand why you need to change it. They may not understand the pain that it's causing your team, which is why you're looking at a switch. So gaining that consensus, starting very early, making sure people feel like they're involved is, is super important. Then you have an architecture review to go through, um, which we'll talk, to, talk about as well. Um, I know a lot of people aren't necessarily familiar with architecture reviews. It's not a thing that we do very commonly. Oops. Sorry. It's not a thing that we do very commonly in our industry. Um, but it can be very helpful in, the, in this process. And then you have a production launch review at the end. Okay. So the consensus I mentioned, you want to seek input really early from other engineers, other people in your, uh, in your organization, not just to convince them, but because people outside your group may have really good ideas on how to implement this or may have issues with things you've overlooked. You may be focusing on the stress that the existing technology has caused you, and other people may also have problems, different problems, or they may have things that you need to take into account with a new piece of software. So the architecture reviews. Um, I actually said at the top of this, they have one goal, find a path to success. Um, I think actually architecture reviews probably have two goals. One is to find a path to success, and the other is actually not to say no. A lot of people feel like if, uh, especially if you're in a traditional operations environment, you may feel like you're gatekeepers to production, you're, you're making sure production stays stable. That's your goal, right? You want to make sure the site stays up, everything keeps working, and if you're going to introduce ne new technologies, there has to be a point where you can say, no, like this new thing is crazy. The purpose of an architecture review isn't to be that gateway. It's to find a way to turn a thing that engineers want into a viable solution at the end. You go through and you ask the questions. You ask the hard questions here. You, fi you have to figure out, if somebody wants something, why do, they, why do they want this technology in production? And if you think it's not a great idea, you need to voice that and figure out how you can turn it from a no into a yes. If something is actually really a terrible idea, you won't have to say no, it'll become self-evident. For example, going, you know, I, I mentioned that if, you're, if a team doesn't have the ability to maintain a new piece of technology in your stack, maybe you're introducing something that, again, you know, no one has experience with, that should come up in an architecture review. And you should be able to say, hey, if we roll this out and it breaks, no one knows how to fix it. What are we going to do? And at that point, you find a solution to that. But this is where those discussions should happen. It's also a really good place to establish new design patterns. You want to be working with things that you, uh, you know, aren't going to be new, aren't going to be surprises, n not lots and lots of new ways of working. Try and change as little as you can when you introduce a new technology. Building consensus is also going to lead to disagreements. There are going to be people who say, no, I think this is a really bad idea. I don't want us to do this. But there's an important, uh, there's no, an important philosophy in, uh, in team dynamics. It's called disagree and support. If the rest of the organization and everybody else says, yes, we really need to roll this out, even if you think it's a bad idea, and this is really hard, even if you think it's a bad idea, it's OK to disagree, but you should provide support at the end of that and you should be willing to make it a success, whatever it is. This is by far the hardest thing that I've had to do in my career, is figure out how to support something that I don't like or that I disagree with. But as a senior engineer, that's my job. If that's what the company needs, if that's what the organization needs, I need to be on board with this, and I need to be able to figure out how to do this. If there's one thing you take away from out of everything else in this talk, make it that, disagree and support. Okay, so you've gained consensus and you're trying to figure out what to do next and how to get it to production. Hopefully everybody has a production launch review process. You don't just roll everything out. Um, but it's worth mentioning some of the things that you have to think about before you actually go to production. Um, one of those, the, you know, the very first one, 
how are you going to test your monitoring? How are you going to test that alerting works? How are you going to test that everything is okay? You need to be able to validate all of this information. On the software engineering side, we have unit tests for testing changes to software. On the operation side, I think the industry is still trying to figure out how do we test that our metrics are valid. We don't really have a great solution yet. We have a couple of things that have been thrown around for a while, but this is something that's still very manual. We have to take a look at it. Does that zero on the graph actually mean that everything's okay, or does it mean that my, my metrics and alerting are broken? So find a way to be able to test what it is you're rolling out and test these changes. Have run books. Make sure you know how to deal with problems when they arise. And this, again, this goes back to having that knowledge, having that ramp up, understanding how the technology works, and having it all written down. This is the 3 a.m. scenario. When you get paged at 3 a.m. to try and fix something, and you're really tired, and you don't know what's going on, you want to be able to go to one place and say, OK, I'm seeing these symptoms. This is how I can fix this particular problem. Do it, and then go back to bed. Hopefully, you won't get paged at 3 a.m., but if you do, you'll have that there. Game day exercises are fun. Who's, who's run a game day exercise before in production? Oh my god, okay. So game day exercises are the best. This is, this is something that everybody should be doing. Every hand in this room should be up a year from now. How do you know what to do with a piece of technology when it breaks? How do you test the edge cases? Let's say you have a registration system for a website. If the backend database goes down, how does it handle it? How do you make it resilient to failure? Let's say you have an asynchronous queue process. Let's say that goes down. How does the website queue up tasks to be done in the background when that's down? You need to be able to figure out the answers to all of these, and the only way to do it is to deliberately break your infrastructure and see how it responds. You can try and do it. There are a lot of ways you can do it and mitigate impact to users. Maybe set up a you know, sort of a shadow, data, uh, shadow infrastructure. Maybe have it um, have all. Ideally, you'll have all this testing done before you go into production. But I'm guessing there's a lot of stuff that you already have in production. And you don't know like, what's going to happen when it blows up. Figure out a way to run these exercises. Um, there's a lot of information out there. If you, just, if you Google for, you know, how to run game day exercises in technology, you'll find stuff. A lot of talks have been given at other conferences on this. Um, it's very important. It, it's probably one of, the, one of the things that's gonna save you when adding new technology and knowing how it breaks. So you can fix all those, those cases before you go live. And then you have the final go, no go um, to launch into production. And that's it. Hopefully at this point you've gone through all of these things. It's a really long process and it's taken much longer than you wanted and you've gotten something into production. But now you need to remove the old piece of technology from production. This bit's a lot shorter. I've gone over most of my slides already. Um, but this bit involves, again, a lot more of the, the people stuff, the soft skill stuff. I'm guessing that most people here, at some point in their career, have had a really difficult problem that they've been trying to solve. And they've had this flash of inspiration. They said, you know, after like thinking about it for like days or weeks, I said, I can solve this in this really novel way, this really unique way. And this flash of inspiration happens, and like, you go to the keyboard, you start writing things down, you start knocking things out, and you have this beautiful, elegant solution at the end of it that you're really proud of. I know I've had those. I've had those multiple times. And you get really attached to that solution because you're like, wow, that was really cool. I did this really hard thing, and look at what I did. I saved the company time, money. My team loves it. Everyone's so happy. You have to be ready for all of that to be replaced. Every bit of work you do should be ready to be thrown out the day it goes out the door, the day it goes live. I'm like, I mean, it's right, right? Like, if you hang on to old code, old technologies, old ways of doing things, all you're going to do is hold yourself back and not be able to bring in new technologies, not be able to solve the new problems in good ways. And it's difficult for us as people because we feel emotionally attached to the things that we create, right? We're proud of them. We're happy about them. But you have to be able to say, okay, this thing I've created, its time has come. I will let this go. Somebody will come by. It might be you. You might replace it with something else. Or somebody else, some new person might come by and say, ah, this old thing doesn't, we don't need it anymore. Don't be offended about that. Be okay with that. Find a way to be okay with that. 
plan your systems for obsolescence. This is pretty hard too when you, you know, let's say you have like large central databases. How do you plan to get rid of those? You don't know what's going to happen in the future, but it's something to keep in mind as you develop things. This is a graph um, a friend of mine created uh, when they were removing a piece of technology from their stack. It's a burn down graph. As they went through and changed bits of code, they could see the number of calls to a piece of code in their, data, in, their, um, in their stack going down over time. And they could tell when they were finished with, the, with the, uh, the deprecation at the very end. And it took, let's see, it took over a year. And this wasn't the beginning of the graph. They actually started way before this. It was way higher. This is just the, the, the last year's view. Having something like this, so you can count how far you have to go, and knowing like how your rate of your rate of uh, change over there is, is 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 important. One of the things that's hard to see on on this graph is that is the progress, and it usually goes something like this. Initially, you'll pick up some steam, and it'll get faster and faster and faster. And you'll be like, "Yeah, we're really making progress. This is going good. We'll have this done in no time." And then you hit a point somewhere, yeah, about eighty percent of the way done, ninety percent of the way done. When things get really slow, this is where you're hitting the hard stuff. You did all the easy stuff. Why'd you do the easy stuff? Because it was easy, so you did it first. Now you have to deal with the hard stuff. Don't worry, persevere, get through it. Keep looking at those graphs, keep burning that stuff down. Go through your runbooks when things break as you're changing things. And you'll find a way through it. Like I said, this stuff is a lot easier. The removing part of the technology is a lot easier than the adding part. But it just takes time. It takes time, perseverance, it takes emotional energy. And that emotional energy at the end needs to be brought back somehow. A lot of times when we remove a bit of technology and we're like, all right, it's done, let's move on to the next thing, and we just go to the next problem, whatever it is, I think it's very, very important to actually celebrate the success of removing technologies. Make people feel like they've actually won, they've done something great. Actually, that's it. Um, if anybody has questions at this point, I'd be happy to take them. <laughs> no microphone. Yes, I have. Um, I will. Uh, I will tweet it out with the slides after this. There is. So the question was, do I have a deeper reference on adding and removing the, the, this stuff and and how to go through this process? This was a very high level overview. Um, but yes, I do, have a, I do have a very good reference. I have a couple of very good references, um, which, I will, which I will send out after this. Yeah. So you, you made a good point about the, the trade-off of technology, like a graphite as an example versus mm -hmm. Prometheus, something like that. Um, is there's, a, there's kind of a balance though, right? Because you've got the ecosystem, right? Some, I, I think you alluded to that, but that's an important point, right? Like, for example, Nagios, we all might say Nagios sucks, but but the ecosystem is that there's a gazillion plugins and and, and so exactly. there's a, you kind of alluded, I just want to hear your thoughts about yeah. the balance of an old software that has an amazing community that's just seemingly never going away yep. versus jumping on to Kubernetes. No, on the Kubernetes. <laughs> uh, yes, no, absolutely. There is, there is definitely a balance. Just because something's new doesn't mean you should jump on it. So I've been using Nagios since uh, late 90s when it was called NetSaint. Right? And I still use it today. And it's a technology that still works for me. It's not actually holding me back. When I go through that, that, uh, that workflow, I say, what are the strengths, what are the weaknesses of the existing system? Is the new one, whatever it might be, you know, I, I know lots of people who have great success with Prometheus, Sensu, whatever they want to use. For me so far, like nothing has replaced Nagios. It's not actually holding me back. There are other technologies that I have used where I've gone through that exercise. And sometimes I just go through the exercise for fun. I say, okay, what is this thing? I've, I kind of take it for granted. I don't really think about it. Um, is it. Is it holding me back? And sometimes I find that it is. Um, and sometimes it can be small and easy. Sometimes it's an entire framework that I'm like, you know, this is really actually causing more problems than I realize. Um, so yeah, going through that and finding the balance, seeing if it's actually true for you is very, very important. Any insight on uh, making a mistake? For example, the future SQL thing I picked, I kind of bit into the life cycle, and I maybe should have stayed with the old thing, but it's too late. 
you'll only, you, the only way to find out is by doing it. So, and it's okay to make mistakes, right? I don't, I, I hate, I hate people thinking that a mistake is going to be some really bad thing. You will only be able to do things and learn from them. If you think you're going to make a mistake and it's going to be tragic and it's going to cause a huge problem you're, and you're very risk averse, you might want to spend a lot more time on this process and really evaluating stuff and figuring out. If you're less risk averse, and yeah, you know, switching databases is a really big deal, maybe start with you know, smaller stuff. Um, it's, it's important to do these things, to figure out what your infrastructure look, looks like, where it's brittle, where it needs help, and, just, and, and accept that you're going to learn from them. And you, it's important to get buy-in from your leadership as well. So everybody is on the same page that, yes, we're trying something. It may not be the best solution. It may cause problems. You'll enumerate as many of them as you can up front. Um, but if you, don't, if you don't try, you know, you're not going to learn from any of it. So that's, that's kind of my philosophy on it. Uh, one, one last question. We're going we're to answer it in like less than 30 seconds. Okay. So go. <laughs> well, he just made me think of another question. Is the, the, we had a situation where we had engineering change from uh, uh, MySQL to um, React, mm -hmm. right? And that was, there was a whole technical debt that they never took into consideration, which is my team had to support it. Yeah. And we went from standards. They understood the code structure because yeah. this is the SQL databases. And when we went to a non-structured database, they couldn't support anything. Yeah. So and I think Etsy wrote a, a blog article about that once too. So Etsy, anyway, Etsy and others have written have written blog articles. I think Facebook's probably written a few, and there there are others certainly. A lot of people have gone through this, and that's why I harped on about your team has to be able to support it. If you're going to make a change, people have to have that that time to learn the new thing. If you don't, oh my God, it's just going to cause you so much pain. Cool. All right. Thanks, Evelyn. I don't want to hold up lunch, which is ready yeah. now. If you're hungry, it's out there, I guess. I, I've been told. So yeah. please give a round of applause to...